Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our panel today, Reading Fantasy Through a Motif Index Lens, which means that we are going to be talking about fantasy literature the same way that uh, social scientists look at folklore. We're going to be talking about patterns and devices, how they've evolved over time and changed and what it all means. And we'll explain a little more to what a motif uh, index is as well. But first, I want to introduce all of our panelists. Today, we have Catherine Crichton, whose works include Salt and Silver, which they wrote under the pseudonym Anna Catherine, and along with the co-author Anna Genoese. Catherine's short fiction has also appeared in Apex Magazine, Lightspeed Magazine, Nightmare Magazine, and Strange Horizons. Uh, most recently, they published Demon Fighter Sucks, as you would, might expect of a demon fighter, uh, in Apex this past May. And Catherine is also currently writing an interactive Regency romance for Heart's Choice. Catherine and their siblings also produce the No Story is Sacred podcast, where they take apart and put stories back together again. Today, we also have Jeffrey Ford, who is the ReaderCon guest of honor. He is the author of 10 novels and over 100 short stories. His most recent books are The Best of Jeffrey Ford, and Big Dark Hole from Small Beer. His work has won or been shortlisted for, this is a long, important list, uh, the World Fantasy Award, the Hugo Award, the Nebula Award, the Theodore Sturgeon Award, the International Horror Guild Award, the Fountain Award, the Shirley Jackson, the Edgar Allan Poe, the Bram Stoker, all those big heavy hitters, uh, the Locus Award, the Cyune Award, which I might be mispronouncing, the Grand Prix de l'Imaginaire and the Nova Fantastica and the Hayakawa Award. Uh, Jeff is also a former professor of writing and literature, and he has taught at the Clarion Writers Workshop, the Antioch University Summer Writing Workshop, and the Stone Coast MFA program, which is at um, the University of Southern Maine. Welcome also to Karen Hewler. Karen's stories have appeared in over 100 literary and speculative magazines and anthologies, from Conjunctions to Clark's World to Weird Tales and a number of best of. Her sixth novel, The Splendid City, is a satirical look at a rogue witch in a crazy breakaway American Republic. Um, I think that's realism. It's coming from Angry Robot. Uh, Wildside Press has also just reissued her award-winning collection, The Inner City, and her fourth collection, The Clockworm, uh, is recently out from Tartarus Books. Last but not least, we have Elle Penelope, who is the author of the fantasy series, The Earth Singer Chronicles, the first book of which, Song of Blood and Stone, was named by Time Magazine one of the 100 best fantasy books of all time. Uh, it also won the 2016 self-publishing ebook award for fiction from the Black Caucus of the ALA before it was picked up by St. Martin's. Uh, the fourth book in the series, The Requiem of Silence, is out on Tuesday. So congratulations in advance. That's really exciting. And Leslie's standalone novel, The Monsters We Defy, is coming next year. Leslie is also an alumna of the Bona Voices Workshop and the Hurst and Wright Foundation Writers Workshop. She is a web developer and former filmmaker, and she also has a podcast, My Imaginary Friends. And I'm your moderator today. My name is Stephanie Feldman. Uh, my first novel, The Angel of Losses, came out a while ago. Uh, I'm also the co-editor of a multi-genre anthology called Who Will Speak for America? And my next novel uh, is a horror story called Saturnalia, and that's coming in fall of 2022. And my next short story, uh, which is also horror, is called The Boyfriend Trap, and that'll be in Asimov's early next year. So those are all of our players today. Um, before we launch into conversation, I wanna come back again to that topic and define our terms for us so we all know what we're talking about. First, folklore. What is folklore? Well, it is any repetitive pattern in a culture. So that could include material culture, that could include other kinds of traditions and customs. Today, we're mostly talking about literature and uh, text-based folklore. So that could include <laughs> myths, <laughs> legends, fairy tales, um, but also jokes, songs, and proverbs. And then what is a motif index? Well, a motif index is a catalog developed by folklorists to track 
devices, tropes, and motifs over time. And a motif itself could be a character, an action, a setting, an object, really any discrete um, element that you can see appearing again and again in different stories. And um, there are many different uh, motif indexes um, that we can talk about today and some uh, modern ones that are created by fans of literature that we'll talk about too. So I wanted to start by asking Catherine a little bit about their background with motif indexes, because I know they've done a lot of research in this area. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what a motif index is and how it has um, influenced your approach to literature. Sure, thank you so much. And thank you so much for everybody for, for being here. Um, so I was a, uh, an undergraduate trying to write a paper, which so many of us are. And uh, I was trying to be really original with my research uh, and, and figure out whether or not there was a connection in, in one of Shakespeare's minor plays, I think it's Cymbeline, whether or not there was a real connection between it and like Snow White, because there's some weird like little details, but did he know about Snow White? Was that a thing? So there I am doing all this research for a paper that did not deserve this much work. And um, I came across uh, something in folklore called a um, the Stith Thompson Motif Index of Folk Literature. And this was sort of uh, uh, the first uh, one of these motif indexes that was really like published. You have like University of Indiana. Um, it's a six volume work and it has a lot of problems, but uh, it showed me this way of categorizing uh, motifs. So it, it, it broke down stories into discrete pieces, like Stephanie said. Um, so for instance, Snow White would have um, Wicked Stepmother. Uh, it would have um, False Death. Um, magical beings, magical being, and then there's a subcategory. So there's magical beings and there's magical beings assisting uh, or um, magical beings neutral. That's the mirror sort of. Um, and then there's magical objects. And so you can break the whole thing down. And on top of that, it would also provide almost like a Dewey decimal uh, a notice, like notice with it. So for Stith Thompson, it was like ST, Stith Thompson. And then, um, you know, if he decided that magical beings actually belonged in like the greater category of like gods and monsters, it would be in that number. And then, you know, uh, family issues belong in family and culture over here. So that'd be like 300. And then he would like divide it even further down. And at the time, it, it frankly overshadowed what I was trying to do, which is very like what being a 20 year old is. And I... I was sitting there thinking it, you could break down stories and have a fun game by just like sending the different index numbers and seeing if people could guess the stories. And once I started thinking about that, I started seeing that kind of a uh, uh, way of thinking about stories. You know, you could take out different blocks and add different blocks in and what can you do with that? Uh, and to a degree, that's kind of what we do on the podcast, um, you know, taking them apart, putting them back together. How can you do that? And in addition, um, I started seeing it in, in the real world too. So I started seeing things like uh, TV tropes is essentially another motif index. It doesn't have that little index score, which I'm like, oh, but it could. But, <laughs> but we find, I find that we spend a lot of time trying to uh, uh, think about stories. It's like, for me, that's what a lot of writing is. How do you put these things together? How do you create it? And readers are doing a similar thing and we can use those tools and we also use the tools of like folklorists who are busy making uh this from another angle who maybe aren't as entrenched in our ideas of things they can point out be like no there's there, technically magical objects and magical things are different and we could be like no they're magic so that's that's kind of where i came to from it and it's, it's affected me ever since and i am no longer 20 but it's still here and you held up one of the volumes. I did. So, <laughs> this is volume one of, of six. six. Um, and it's honestly the whole thing in paperback, like, I'm sorry, in hardcover is, God, it's like $300 because it's the university press. But it's fun to have around, particularly as just a, I need an idea. So you flip through it. And the next thing you see is omnipotent God. So <laughs> throw one of those in. 
but there's a ton available online as well. Uh, the uh, sort of the next uh, uh, related version is the Arn Thompson one or Arnie Thompson. Not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, and you can find those all over the place. So like do a search on motif index and honestly, it opens up the world. It's like tropes, but in a more sort of academic way. And that Arnie Thompson or Arn Thompson index I read has over 2,500 motifs listed in it. So it, yeah, it could keep you busy for a long time. Mm -hmm. So well, like you so said, we are always as writers and readers thinking about these elements, even if we're not thinking about the terms motif or index. And I was curious, Jeff, when you're writing, um, how you approach the issue of familiar tropes and how do you like to use them um, and perhaps subvert them in your work. You know, I just realized last night that I took a class in graduate school at Temple that was supposed to be fairy tales and folklore. And all it was was Stiff Thompson <laughs> and that other guy, Arn, uh, whatever his name was. And just that you know, organizing things by that's that was the whole semester. I thought I was going to be reading fairy tales and folklore, but it was that. So, you know, still, or even with that and how much it bored the hell out of me, I see I see it as a it's purposeful and it's useful. I mean, I see its use. But uh, for me personally, as a writer, I find that dangerous because if you say you want to if you want to cross list the items from a vampire story, right? Uh, you know, you're going to have definitely blood in there and, uh, you know, the vampire and his his, his those in his thrall and so forth or, or in her thrall or their thrall. All right. And uh, you're going to miss a book like Henry James's The Sacred Font, which is a, a story about all these people who will go away on a weekend and how they quietly and secretly drain energy from each other. That's not even going to be considered in there. Or you're going to you're going to uh, want to write a story like um, yeah, there was another one I had in mind, say a ghost story. All right. And I'm always interested, more interested in a ghost story like William Gass's The Peterson Kid, which is about a blizzard. And this guy gets killed and you don't know who or where the killer is, where they're coming from. Uh, and this kid's got to go out and find, and you know, with his father and his father gets killed and he's in the blizzard. Where's the threat coming from? Exactly like a ghost story. You would miss that. It would not be cataloged. So my interest is much more in those things that are not cataloged as a writer, because otherwise I'm taking things that have already been done and I'm putting them together. My concept of writing fiction is not mechanical. It's organic. And it's intuitive. And so that really doesn't do me that much good. Although I still would love to look through that book that Catherine just held up, you know, and see what's in there. But it's just like antithetical to my approach. Now, I'm sure, uh, you know, I can rely on you guys for one of the one of the good purposes of it. And I could see some, too, for hunting down folk tales and folklore. But I'm not a folklorist, you know, and I'm not a, I'm not a scholar. I'm a, a fiction writer. So. Uh, I'm still interested in this subject, though, so I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say about it. <laughs> yeah, it seems that, um, yeah, I see what you're saying about taking a more organic approach. I certainly do, too. I'm not looking up, you know, what should I add to the story, though I think it could be a really fun game and maybe a really good writing exercise for us. Sure a class or, you know, like a weekend by the lake where we all write our masterpieces. Um, but it's interesting that you picked up on also the potential dangers of thinking this way. And Karen, something that you had mentioned earlier was the issue of a, a meaningful or useful trope versus a cliche. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how we maybe use tropes without falling into cliche or what the difference even is. You're muted, Karen, you're muted. Yeah, <laughs> I'm always muted. Uh, it's actually, it was an interesting question for me because I hadn't really thought uh, too much about indexes. Um, and I started trying to prepare for it by trying to come up with 
you know, all sorts of organizational things, which I utterly failed at. Um, but I was also looking at TV, film, and the sort of the cultural touchstones for us and, and starting to group things together. And I found that very, very interesting. Um, my two main preoccupations, I, I would say, are doubles and portals. And then looking at portals, especially through TV, of course, um, it, I thought it was very, very interesting um, it, to see what actually happened with a lot of things. I mean, books, for one thing, are a portal, obviously. And then you go and, and a step further, and Jasper Ford actually makes portals into the books become portals into a different reality so that characters from one book can be kidnapped and taken away and might conceivably appear in, in another one. And that, that was a very interesting um, alternate use of, uh, of a trope. And I think the, the fun thing when you get to what you do with these things once they become standard, um, like the good and evil split when you're dealing with doubles, you know, um, I love, things like Captain Kirk, you know, the old transporter uh, problem and Kirk gets split to a good Kirk and a bad Kirk. And we see that a lot <laughs> in the di different TV uh, series, the good uh, versus evil. And it almost always ends up that the good one is weak and the evil one is very crafty and they have to be re reassembled in order to get the, the complete person. And that becomes a trope for us. Um, and it, it, it's not a trope anymore. It's a, it's a damn cliche at that point. Um, the same thing keeps appearing in just about every Star Trek iteration. Um, but in terms of looking at things from a different point of view, what I love most, I mean, I love every kind of portal. A portal is a, an invitation to adventure. But I really like the kinds of things that use portals in a slightly um, different way. Um, Every Heart is a Doorway by Shanann 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 McGuire. I love because this is what happens to everyone when they go through the portal or changed by it and come back. Um, and that's a different use of a portal when, again, you have to reassimilate into the society you initially came from and away from the society that changed you. Um, Brett Cox has an interesting a story that I, I, I like an awful lot on a what we did on our summer vacation, I think it is, where he just, he and his wife are having uh, struggles in their marriage and they're on a trip and they keep coming across doorways, a doorway in the middle of the field, a doorway here and there. Um, and it goes in an unexpected way. And I like that because the invitation through a portal is so enticing. And we assume of course, that there will be something on the other side. What happens when there's nothing on the other side? I had, I writ a story, um, uh, a man who li lives next door to a portal, who's um, completely annoyed by the fact that people keep coming through the portal and trampling his garden. I mean, I love the idea of starting out with your cliche, but then sort of looking at it from a totally different perspective. Karen, you should check out the book I wrote. It's about a portal at the bottom of a, of a basement and shit keeps coming out and they just gotta deal with it at the basement of a diner. Good, good, I will, thank you. That sounds like my actual basement right now. We're spending a lot of time <laughs> trying to stop the portal. Um, I also wanted to say hi to everyone who is um, watching and commenting uh, on the Discord right now. Um, I see that you have some questions and I'm excited to get into them and please keep sharing them in the Discord. We are gonna um, talk a little more and before we pivot to your questions, but we, we see you and we look forward to talking to you some more. Um, so, so far, I think we've been talking a lot about um, thinking about motifs as writers, but we also have to consider readers in this situation too. And so Leslie, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how readers figure into this discussion for you, if readers are doing the work of categorizing things or you know, how you as a writer think about readers and how tropes might mean different things to different audiences and how that affects your choices. Yeah, definitely. So since I come, I started out uh, self-publishing before I moved into traditional publishing. And I think the idea of art versus commerce is very different, especially for more literary writers, as opposed to if you're starting out self-publishing, when you know the onus of the marketing is on you. And so there's a lot of different schools of thought, but uh, some of the most 
um, you know, successful, like financially successful self-publishers are thinking about the tropes as marketing tools up front before they even write their stories. So whereas Jeffrey has a great point, you know, it can be hindering as a writer. It can also be, it can open up possibilities when you're looking to market your books, especially when you have to do it entirely on your own. So if you're looking at the Amazon categories, you're looking at, you know, not genre, you know, first of all, you're looking at genre is what is this? How do I place it? How do I tell my audience what this book is? So they, they know what to expect. And then when you're choosing your cover designer, um, you want to, everything goes into that. So, you know, the, if you're calling them tropes or motifs or even, you know, whether they're cliche or not, I think is in the eye of the beholder to a certain degree, but using, using them as, as a tool. So there's a whole um, like movement to write to market, which is very controversial. Uh, it's not something I personally can do with my writing, but it is the idea that you look at what's selling and you look at the tropes of the top sellers and then you write something for that audience. You know, the audience is already buying, um, you know, science fiction, you know, like space opera, military sci-fi. And so you try to do something in that vein that gives the audience what they've already proven that they want. And it's, it's like going more towards the business side of it and then trying to hopefully inject your art into it and your own, you know, view and your artistry as a writer so that you're not just giving them trash. <laughs> like you're hopefully giving them a good story. At the end of the day, that's what readers want too. And also coming from a romance perspective, like I, I write fantasy romance, I'm a romance reader and tropes are incredibly important to romance uh, readers. And I think they're also important to a, maybe a lesser degree to science fiction and fantasy readers, but like I picked up a book based on the title. The title was Grumpy Ex-Boyfriend. Uh, <laughs> and it was just like, yeah, tropes. All the tropes are in the title. Marketing, I knew what I was going to get. Uh, and I know since it's a romance, it's going to have a happy ending. And, you know, I'm happy. So there's, there's a, it's like a spectrum, I think, of, of paying attention to that from a writing perspective. If you know your tropes or your motifs or the, the things that a reader is going to grab onto, then you can pitch the book. You can pitch it to agents and editors. They can sell it to the bookstores. They can get the buy off. There's a, there's a lot of benefits to it. Um, in addition to like the very real concerns of, am I boxing myself into a corner or am I going to write something that everyone else is writing? And it really depends on your goals as a writer. Are you writing for art or are you writing to support yourself? And often those are two different paths that you're taking and they're going to make you have two different, you know, styles or approaches. Just piggybacking a little bit off of Leslie. Uh, yeah, absolutely about the romance thing. If I see something that says fake dating, I'm there in a heartbeat. It doesn't <laughs> matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it, it, there's a cartoon out there, the, the two cakes cartoon, um, which is how a writer feels, you know, you bring your cake, and it's kind of tiny. And there's a beautiful one on the table. And you're like, Oh, somebody already brought a nice cake. But to the audience, they're like, oh, two cakes. And so <laughs> that's how I kind of feel about it. Like, I don't care how many fake dating stories there are, or how many, uh, you know, uh, portal stories or whatnot. Yeah, I'm there. And knowing that ahead of time is really good for me. I, I think it's so great to just be very explicit about the fact that genre, when we use the word genre, sometimes we're talking about a marketing category, we're talking about a shelf in a bookstore or a tag on Amazon or whatever it is. And sometimes we're talking about genre as in a set of tools or conventions that um, an author is using and that there can be that overlap, but they can also be very distinct things and how sometimes that can be limiting for a reader. It can be useful for a reader because if you know, did you say fake dating, Catherine? Fake. Okay, I don't know what that is, but I'm like very curious <laughs> um, how that can be useful for a reader because you're like, okay, this is the kind of thing I like and now I know how to find it, but it can also be limiting because maybe you love energy vampires, but you don't know to look for that from Henry James, like Jeff mentioned earlier, because you know, a certain big genre label has been put on one thing and not on another thing. And um, you, so you're actually not finding what you would enjoy. Um, and earlier, Catherine, you had mentioned TV tropes. And I thought maybe you could talk about that in maybe AO3 a little bit, which was new to me from our conversation. And, you know, when we talk about these folklore indexes, these were, you know, these are things created by professional academics, as opposed to um, an audience of fans. So could you, I mean, tell us a little bit about what AO3 even is? Sure, so uh, AO3 refers to archive of our own. Uh, so 
of our own. That's the three of O. And they won a Hugo last year <laughs> or the whichever time happened. Um, uh, literally, actually, for the um, for kind of the, the not necessarily the stuff within it, uh, which is all fan fiction and some original work, um, but uh, uh, but for the way it was constructed, for the fact that it existed. Um, and part of that, I think, is actually their tagging system, which is where I kind of connect it to this, because originally it was sort of developed, again, for sort of content tags, content warnings. But what developed was, um, you know, people would put like the characters, you know, so if you only want to read about Mulder from X-Files, great, you can look for that. But then people started adding not just, uh, uh, you know, helpful tags, but maybe sort of talking about the tropes. Because if, again, the two cake thing, once you find something you want to read, you want to read a lot of it. So people started doing things like, you know, uh, uh, guess what? There was only one bed, um, which refers to the characters are in a situation where, oh, no, there's only one bed. What are they going to do? But then you need Mulder and Scully. <laughs> See? But what if you don't care if it's Mulder or anybody? Mulder, there was only one bed. And there could be Mulder and his bed. Maybe it's a whole like thing about that, which kind of gets into uh, uh, Jeffrey's thing about like exploring the different uh, permutations. But, uh, or uh, for fake dating, you didn't know what that, that's where you have to date, but you're not dating for real. But will feelings develop? <laughs> so, <laughs> the whole thing. Um, so what happens is, so we have the audience sort of developing for their own sake, uh, these kind of tropes and these things that did not exist within the academia or even I would say marketing for uh, uh, commercial purposes. It was purely audience driven. And if we look at that, we can see, we can learn from that. Like, well, wait, what is the audience into? Um, and you can identify what you're putting in stuff because, you know, I, I, there's things that uh, I haven't done fake dating. I would love to, though. Um, and that that tells me that, you know, maybe that's something for me to pursue because I know that there's an audience for it. And I already know I like it. Um, or maybe I've already written something and I'm like, I didn't even think of pitching it for that in that way. Um, and that's where, again, uh, Jeffrey, the, the idea of like, well, no, these are these are vampires. You can talk about it that way. But then you sort of talk about it in a, you know, this is a genre, this is a, a trope busting or a cliche busting. This is vampires, but in a different way. And that's always very exciting. <laughs> you know, here's a traditional thing, but here's how it's different. Um, and so using these to like, so still having the organic, but then using these to have a business career, I think is useful and finding these alternate sources. So AO3 is one, TV tropes is another, which is, I wish it was better organized like an index because otherwise you get sucked into the pool and you stay there for three hours. Um, but yeah, just doing some exploration there. Uh, another example you could even call, uh, I think it's Diana Wynne Jones's tough guide to fantasy land. Um, I, I would call another one of these kinds of motif indexes. And the idea is, you know, you go to a, a bar and there's nut brown ale and to it, to a degree, she's she's making fun of it, but it's also just a like this is what a lot of fantasy was like. So you can kind of dive in there and and you know play around and use it for marketing. Um, before we get to our audience questions, Leslie, I know that you have created systems of folklore within your world, and I was wondering if you talk a little bit about how you do that and um, how all of our conversation about motifs figures into that. Yeah, so in the Earthsinger Chronicles, my fantasy series, uh, I have epigraphs before each chapter. And especially the first book is actually collected folk tales. So I created folk tales, uh, like tiny little folk tales so they'd be epigraph sized. Um, and the other three books have other examples of folklore, uh, whether it's like an epic poem that, or a creation myth or something like that. So I was playing around with them as a way to expand the world or show more about the world that's not necessarily in the story, in the narrative, but you're getting these, you know, these uh, invented books that are the in-world books that I'm pulling from. And my, my goal in the folk tales especially was 
to try to make them different, to try to make them like a little bit off. So I, I studied a lot of different folklore and a lot of different, um, like I read like Khalil Gibran's The Prophet, which I guess is not folklore, but, um, and then, you know, from folklore from different uh, countries and tried to find similarities in them and then tried to twist them so that it's sort of just like, almost like bad advice or like if these are the foundational texts of, of you know, myth or things that have been passed down and they're all, they're a little like off and strange and you're like, wait, what? Um, and it was also just a lot of fun to do that, but kind of trying to innovate, you know, trying to make something that was a little bit different um, and incorporate these, like the value systems and, uh, or at least the previous value systems of the world. So it was just, it was world building, um, not so much tropes, although I think that comes in there automatically, but I think that, you know, if you're creating your own, especially in fantasy, like myths and um, legends, there are songs, there's poetry, there's religious texts. There's a lot of extra work done just to fill out the holes in, in the world and contribute hopefully to the other tropes that are actually in the narrative. That's what I was trying to do. That raises a question, you know, not just what is folklore, but what does folklore do? And there's a folklorist named William Bascom, and he said that folklore has specific functions. And one of those functions is to uh, reinforce values. Um, one of them is entertainment. Um, but a lot of what folklore is doing, he said, is to reinforce social norms to educate audiences about this. These are the kinds of things we do. Like we don't go into the woods because there's a witch there. Um, or this is how we behave as like young girls who have to go marry a beast husband, you know, maybe your husband's kind of beastly, but you know, it's for the best. So I don't know, maybe you'll get like a dancing candelabra out of it. Just go with it. Something like that. <laughs> so um, I was wondering too, if we think of our stories or maybe the stories we read as having similar functions and do you consider what kind of values are you reinforcing to your readers? Or is that maybe not something that you think about as a writer? This is open to everybody. Don't consider it. Never consider it. Um, I do in terms of politics and feminism. I think um, most of my stories are pitched at um, somehow warning about the world and the way we treat things and or creating a world where there's more equality in the story, in the world of the story. I think about it similarly. Um, I don't know that I do it consciously up front, but by the time I'm revising it, I'm looking at what I did and then seeing if I can reinforce it. Um, and so since my books do tend to be like deal with political issues and sort of modern social issues through a fantasy lens, then I am thinking about you know, the issues Karen was talking about, um, you know, racism and uh, equality and, you know, the, because it's so diverse and there's LGBTQ characters and are they accepted here and not accepted, all of those things are just come out in the story. And then by the end, I'm making sure that it actually is something that I either, either I believe in or I think is worth questioning and, and the reader thinking about. I agree with, with that a great deal, but I do, I, in my, in my latest um, Demon Fighter Sucks, I actually, did try to specifically add in what I consider to be a missing lesson in today's youth, um, which is an older one, which is don't randomly try to summon fairies. Like, don't do it. It's a bad idea. Um, and, and so that's where I was kind of trying to consciously do that. But in terms of, of um, what Jeffrey was saying, I, I, I don't specifically try to um, uh, do messages specifically for an audience. It's more like messages that I agree with. And that's where Leslie's and, and Karen's come in. Um, well, you know, if you're, if you're gonna, you know, fiction isn't about big ideas. Fiction is about, writing fiction is about what happened and what happened next. Let the reader bring the ideas to it. You know, the reader find the ideas in it. It's not that what I would write would not be political or about race or about feminism or something like that. But it's not a concern of mine to begin with. I got to find the story and tell the story. I mean, that's number one. And if they're putting ideas in there, like I'm filling cream donuts on the graveyard shift, that's like, you know, I might as well write an essay is my feeling about it, you know? 
it's just the way I feel about it. Well, I agree. And I think uh, you always bring your world with you when you're writing, though. Um, so yeah. what, what forms you as an individual and as a writer uh, gets demonstrated through the stories you choose to develop. So I think even when you're not doing it consciously, um, a lot of the time you're doing it subconsciously by what you're picking and choosing, since all stories require choices. Yeah. It sounds like also maybe just um, a different kind of process you know, and I've been teaching all week for my MFA program. And um, we're talking about how do you plan a story out versus do you sit down to write and see what happens and then figure it out later? And it seems so personal. And I think our whole discussion has shown how writers can approach this very differently. And some of um, our audience members in the discord have gotten to this too and are saying things like, well, but if we're analyzing these tropes are we like pinning a butterfly to a board you know and, and killing it there on the wall or could it be a useful constraint like um, a sonnet you know where you have very specific rules but within those rules that can give you even new ideas and more creativity um stephanie just just about that actual point right there about uh, uh are you pinning something down it's a huge issue within folklorist circles like within that and I have a whole discussion I can do in the hallway after if anybody has any questions. Yes, we're going to reassemble in the, um, the You know, one of the, th one one of the things these guys were talking about, Catherine and Leslie were talking about before, this idea of considering the marketplace. I've always done best when I just write idiosyncratically whatever's inside me, but I will say this. It might have been a damn good idea when I started out to start thinking about that, but forget it now. It's too late. <laughs> I take my hat off to them. <laughs> uh, we have another question about um, urban legends and sort of these contemporary um, fantasies and legends that come about. And can you analyze those in the same way? And I think a folklorist would say, yes, that this is sort of contemporary folklore. Um, but I was wondering maybe if we see an overlap between contemporary folklore, urban legends, and sort of intentional fiction writing. Like <coughs> I see it on Reddit, maybe where people are embellishing. And, um, you know, if you see any overlap in the work that you like to read or the work that you're doing. It's a, actually, it's really funny that you mentioned Reddit. Uh, I follow, um, uh, I follow Am I the Asshole? And um, uh, relationships. And uh, there's a, there's a, people go through, and there's developing tropes there if you read the comments. So people will say like, oh, age difference. We know, yeah, yeah. Or if that's not a detail that comes out, they're all like, I see that, I see this, 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 is this what's gonna happen? And then a comment pops up and they're like, yes, I knew it, which goes to, you know, cultural thing. But it's another, it's another <laughs> example of where there's different tropes, different uh, motifs that show up depending on the space and the culture. And I think that definitely applies to urban fantasy, modern, contemporary fantasy, even things like memes. You know, like if you're talking about the Reddit things, you know, you can categorize, you can, you know, have a taxonomy for anything that exists, basically. I think that humans, part of what we are is we want to categorize things and, and organize things into groups and make, try to make sense of the world, right? So, um, yeah, if, even if you have some sort of tiny niche uh, market or, or genre, it, it, readers are going to come to it with their own ideas and they are probably going to start you know, putting things into boxes, and then you can either take note of that or not. But I, I do think it's, it can be useful for whatever whatever's happening, honestly. This panel also gave me a great opportunity to revisit um, Carmen Machado's In the Dream House, which is a speculative memoir. And she applies um, one of these indexes to uh, the story of her own life. And she has footnotes in here. Um, you know, like this one incident makes her think of the type E279.3 from Stith Thompson, ghost pulls bed clothing from sleeper. And she's got them throughout. And one of our questions is um, about these indexes and how granular they can be. Um, is there, you know, could you have a one word 
motif. And I think I, not being an expert, but just someone who's interested in the topic, what I find more is that they become uh, very long because that's how they become granular. Like a ghost pulling bedclothes is very specific, but yet distinct enough that it appears across so many other stories. Or another one is the liar saying, I have no time to lie today, but then lies anyway. There are a million different kinds of taboos. One taboo is asking for reason of unusual action. I guess you're not supposed to do that. So I'm going to remember that when I'm not conjuring fairies. Yeah, the shorter, the, the broader the, the, the thing, the smaller the phrase. And then that's how you, uh, I, I was flipping through this to see if I, and I, I just flashed by the word bandicoot. And I'm like, really? I can't find it again. But um, presumably, but it was one of the, the higher, it, it's all like, you know, uh, it tabs in. So that was definitely one of the more. Um, Leslie, we also have a, a question for you um, about the folklore that you've written. When did writing epigraphs and creating the folklore first happen in your process? It happens at the very end. So honestly, my editor suggested that I do chapter epigraphs and she referenced Octavia Butler, I think Parable of the Sower, Parable of the Talents have them. Brandon Sanderson does them a lot. I was researching authors who do really interesting uh, chapter epigraphs. And uh, so I, I wait till, I till the end of the book till basically right before I, I do it for copy edits, send it for copy edits. And I take two weeks to, while I'm doing the final revision, to think about, okay, what is this? What's the in-world text that I'm going to use? What am I trying to achieve with the epigraphs? Um, so, and I actually, someone mentioned a sonnet. I think it's book two, where I do this epic poem. So there's like 55 chapters. So there's stanzas and I had a, you know, I had, it was iambic pentameter. I had a, it was like six lines. It was very difficult <laughs> to do, but I wanted to, you know, create an epic poem that had a, a certain rhyme scheme. And, um, yeah, so I just, I, and then I, I do chapter by chapter, find like the themes in the chapter and try to also make sure that the epigraph is doing its job to set up for the chapter in addition to the other work of telling a story or whatever. So it is, yeah, definitely. And, and just, it's like a bonus. It's like icing on the cake. I think of it as. And we have another process question too. Um, if we're not necessarily always thinking about tropes when we begin writing, do we go back when we're revising our draft and see where they have crept in and what we should do with them? And this makes me think of um, the sort of tropes I find that are like specific to my own work, which nobody else would see, but I see them and I think, oh, I'm doing the same thing again. Should I do the same thing again? Like, you know, uh, hand, like people's hands keep coming up in weird, like not coming up, but like hands are very important in my work. And I think, is this, am I developing a thing here or am I just repeating myself? And so I know that's something that I always look for in, in my own work. Um, how about everyone else? Does this figure more into your revision than in your initial planning? Um, if I can jump in, I think that's a very interesting point because I was thinking about the, the same sort of thing uh, when I started trying to get my own index going on tropes. And uh, there are repetitive things that um, I keep looking at from different points of view, but I'm also thinking, you just mentioned somebody who tried to do a motif index of her own life. And that I think is absolutely um, intriguing and, and perhaps might end up being a cliche rather than a trope. It's wonder, I'm sorry, I missed that. I was looking down. <laughs> it's, uh, called in, against, in, it's in the dream house. In the dream house? Carmen oh, Maria. Okay. Yeah. And I, I would imagine that the same sorts of things and the same sort of motifs that pop up in our life are also the same sort of motifs that influence our reading and also influence the, our concerns when we're writing, except possibly for Jeff Ford, um, who is all over the place. He once said that writing isn't that hard. All you do is create a character and follow them around all day. So I think that uh, Jeff might not be as tied to uh, tropes as I am. Um, Jeff, <laughs> do oh, you think? No, I, I think they come out in the writing. And I think you recognize them uh, like like Stephanie said, uh, when you know, when you finish with it, it may not come to you for a couple of weeks or a year, years that you're writing about the same damn thing again. But I think it was Emerson who said there's only two types of writers. 
One is the type that writes, always writes about the same idea. And that's not bad. That's the idea you're working out. And yeah. readers are, are working through and seeing different permutations of in your work. And I forget what the other writer was. I guess somebody who's constantly uh, novel, original. But I find that's... I find that I write in the, in the long run, even though these are like dark, horrific stories sometimes and weird and so forth. I'm, in my novels, I'm always writing about family. It's a group of people who don't really belong together, but find each other. That's always part of it. Although there's a lot more stuff going on in them than that, you know, but that is part of it uh, in every novel that I've written. So, I mean, I, I came to that later in life that I realized that, you know, so I like that. If I do it again, I'd be happy if I did it. You know? <laughs> I do want to say that uh, I don't, I don't review to see what I've done to see like, oh, if I've done this before. Again, two cakes. I don't care that much about that. What I do care about is that there are tropes, there are motifs that are damaging, that are, you know, uh, problematic is a really big word and it covers way too much. But for instance. I recognize that I am from a, uh, I, I'm, I have a bunch of marginalizations, but I also have a lot of not marginalizations. So if I act like I want to review my work to make sure I'm not pulling in tropes and cliches and motifs that are actively, like academically fascinating to study, but because I'm putting out into the culture that stuff, is that, is that what I want to be doing? So, you know, if I do have X, Y, Z, you know, a uh, uh, fetishization, however you pronounce that, I should probably not have that. And also, you know, spend some time with myself. But <laughs> that's a kind of what I do afterward. Can you give an example? Um, yeah, so I, I uh, this is not something that is going to be published. I've trunked it. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> um, but I did want to write a, 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 you know, a police story. Yeah, you know, because police procedurals is a great topic, right? Oh, it's a very popular, everybody loves. And then the last two years happened, which I realize is not new for several people. But for me, I'm like, you know what? Am I contributing? Is this helpful? Is this helpful for me to have hero cops, you know, solving crimes that they don't necessarily, like, that they don't necessarily have to be the people doing? Like, maybe this is a better job for social services. Would it be a better story if it was social services? Oh, <gasps> see, so it kind of goes from there but it's examining the tropes. And part of that was also coming up with the elevator pitch. So I'm sitting there and be like, oh, it's a, you know, urban fantasy uh, police procedural with, with folklore. And I'm like, oh yeah. And, but then I started like, does it need to be this? Like what has uh, uh, SVU and all of that done to our consciousness in terms of what's okay for police, et cetera. Um, and, and I decided I didn't want to contribute to that. Um, and I'll just take all that stuff and put it in something else. But it is that examination after the fact. Well, we're just about at the end, but our, the, these last two comments got um, sort of got close to answering one of our last questions, which is how do motifs or which motifs get close to deep truths about human nature? And when we see that things are repeated, like a concern about family, you know, that's what's important to this particular author, to these readers. When we see something like police procedurals, I learned a new word, copaganda this past year. And, <laughs> you know, what, is, what does that say about our society? And what does that say about human nature? Um, you know, maybe from a completely other direction. So um, since we are at the end, I just want to say thank you again to everyone. This has been such a great conversation and we can continue it in the discord in um, hallway number one. So I hope that uh, everyone can stick around for a few minutes and we can um, talk out some of these last questions we didn't get to. And um, thank you. And everyone enjoy the rest of your conference weekend. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank great you. to meet everybody. Yeah, you too. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.